Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our proposers webinar for the Elevate Youth California Youth Substance Use Disorder Prevention Program Standard Track RFA. We'll go ahead and begin shortly. We'll give folks um, a few moments to jump on, connect their audio, um, and we'll, we'll start shortly. For those who are on, if you want to go ahead and drop your name, organization, county in the chat, feel free to. Um, and we'll begin in just a few moments. Good morning, everyone. Again, um, this slide just has, uh, if you're having any audio issues, if you can't hear me speaking, um, then just ways to connect. Um, just a reminder that all participants are going to be muted during the webinar. And if you have any questions, please submit them through the chat feature or in the Q&A. And we do request that, we do ask that you submit your questions in Q&A over the chat, just so that way it's not lost. Um, but in case chat is preferred, feel free to drop it there. Our team will be monitoring that as well to make sure that um, we're receiving those. And if um, you do, just make sure you're clicking either everyone or to host and panels hosts and panelists, um, so that way we do receive your questions. Next slide, please. Good morning, all, and welcome again to the Elevate Youth California Youth Substance Use Disorder Prevention Program Standard Track Request for Applications Review Webinar. Um, this call or this webinar will cover the RFA and um, the key components of it. Um, the training or this webinar is recorded and will be posted to the website along with the slide deck as well slide. Just wanted to go ahead and introduce our team. Um, not with us today is Matt Cervantes, our Managing Director of Healthy Youth Development, um, who uh, this is one of the programs in his portfolio. Um, uh, my name is Bulvinder Gore, and I serve as a Senior Program Officer here at the Center and the Day-to-Day -to -day to Lead with Elevate Youth California. And I'll pass it over to Antonio. Good morning, everyone. My name is Antonio Gonzalez. I am the newest uh, program associate to the team, and I'm happy to share space with everyone here today. I'll pass it over to Latajane. Good morning, everyone. My name is Latajane Hall, and I serve as a program associate on the EYC team. I'm so nice to be with all of you today, and I'll pass it over to Shira. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shira Murray. I'm a senior program associate with the Elevate Youth California team. We're excited um, that you're here with us today. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Travis. Good morning, everybody. My name is Travis Wells. I'm another senior program associate on the day-to-day -day team. I'm excited to potentially meet you all um, and work with you all in the future. And I'll pass it over to Gerald. Good morning, everyone. Gerald White here, the program assistant with Elevate Youth California. And that concludes this team, uh, but I'm gonna pass it back to Paul Bender. Thanks, Gerald. And then we'll also um, uh, go ahead and introduce um, Jessica, give an opportunity for Jessica to introduce herself as well. Um, awesome, thanks so much. My name is Jessica and I am the section chief of the program and policy section at the Department of Healthcare Services. And I'll go ahead and pass it back to Paul Bender. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so today we're going to go ahead and cover a program background about the Elevate Youth California program, the funding opportunity, um, as all of you are, are very eager to learn more about that. And hopefully at this point, you've had a chance to also review the RFA um, that's been posted to the website. Um, we'll talk about how to apply. We'll walk through um, the application itself and um, how to be competitive. Next slide. Pass it back to Jessica. Thanks, Palvinder. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Jessica and I'm the section chief of the program and policy section at the Department of Healthcare Services. My section oversees the Elevate Youth California program. And so this is just a slide, just a reminder on um, that our department does oversee the project and then where how the program is funded. So the, pro so the project is a project 
um, of the center under contract with the Department of Healthcare Services, and it is funded through the DHCS Prop 64 California Cannabis Tax Allocation Fund, specifically known as YAPETA, also known as the Youth Education Prevention and Early Intervention and Treatment Account. So we just want to get the disclaimer that this is a part of the cannabis tax revenue, and that's how we are able to implement Elevate Youth California throughout the state. We can go to the next slide. And I just want to give um, a couple of uh, notes on our mission and vision. As many of you know, the mission of Elevate Youth California is it's a statewide program addressing substance use disorder by investing in youth leadership and activism for youth of color and 2S LGBTQ plus youth ages 12 to 26 living in communities disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Our vision here at Elevate Youth California is that we see a uh, a state where all California youth should have equitable opportunities to be leaders and change agents in their community. As I mentioned, although this program is under the purview of the Department of Healthcare Services, we truly could not implement this program without Palvinder and her amazing team over at the center. Um, the center is the admin entity, so for a majority of the time you will hear specifically from the center, um, but we look forward to reviewing all of your applications and wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Jessica. Go to the next slide. And as Jessica mentioned, um, the center um, known as Sierra Health Foundation Center for Health Program Management, um, typically known as the center at Sierra Health Foundation is the administrative entity. And so we manage the day-to-day -day, um, uh, uh, program for Elevate Youth California. And it is really a true partnership with the California Department of Healthcare Services. And we're grateful um, for this partnership. Um, the center was launched in 2012 and really to bring together people, ideas, and infrastructure together um, to create positive change all throughout California. Um, and we're dedicated to health and racial equity. It's a key component of uh, the center, and it's great to see that reflected in the program as well. Next slide. And so an over, the overarching program goal um, for Elevate Youth California, we are grounded in social justice youth development. Um, really looking to support a, a statewide network of organizations. We currently fund over uh, 240 organizations across the state um, uh, around youth substance use disorder prevention, education, and early intervention. Um, this is startup activities and or enhancement efforts. And we have a focus in both low income urban and rural areas throughout California. And then again, um, the overarching piece around it is uh, around social justice youth development is to be able to impact policy systems and environmental change. Next slide. Uh, on our website, you'll be able to see um, a map of all of our funded partners. And this map shows um, our currently funded partners um, are all of the funded partners that have been uh, supported through the Elevate Youth California starting in March of 2020. And our even includes our most recent cohort from May of 2023, just a few months ago. Next slide. On our website, if you're curious to know or more about our partners, again, you can access this map under Program Impact, but you can also see each of our uh, cohorts um, under the Program Impact tab as well. They're listed by cohort, so the, the timing that they started um, in the program, so uh, that's listed, and I'll uh, go ahead and share more about what standard and, and capacity means in just a moment. But you can visit um, our website, elevateyouthca.org, for more information about our funded partners. Next slide. As I mentioned, this is the um, uh, request for applications for the standard track. Um, in round five funding, we have two separate tracks uh, that, that are going to be um, uh, happening uh, in, in this particular round of funding. Uh, what we're talking currently about the standard track, which will go for three years, um, so 36 months up to $10 million can be requested. Um, uh, and the release of the RFA was released in July. And again, this particular track really focuses on policy system environmental change. Um, that is through youth activism, mentorship, and peer-led support. So we're really looking in this, uh, in this funding opportunity to ensure that young people, youth and young adults ages 12 to 26, are centered and are leading um, uh, the policy change work that's happening, that's being proposed. Additionally, uh, we do anticipate in uh, early 2024 to be able to um, share more about our capacity building track. This track is uh, for two and a half years, so 30 months, and uh, awards will range from $100,000 to $400,000. 
uh, and really looking at strengthening the organizational uh, infrastructure of CBOs and particularly focusing on those that are emerging and grassroots, wanting to be able to support uh, the organizational infrastructure to be able to advance their work. Um, as, as we specifically know that for grassroots and emerging organizations, that is a very critical part in their startup. And so now we'll dive into the uh, funding opportunity. And I do see a handful of questions that are in uh, the, the Q&A portion, which is great. I'm gonna probably get to some of those in just a little bit and our colleague, my colleagues will also be responding to them directly in the Q&A piece, but we'll get to them if they're not answered. And also just to clarify um, afterwards as sometimes it's helpful to, to have them shared out loud as well. So this is just a snapshot of the of RFA. So hopefully you've all seen this um, uh, and, and uh, have vi uh, visited our website to be able to select the RFA and have read through it. I cannot encourage you enough to be able to ensure that you read through the complete request for applications document prior to beginning your application. The RFA document will give you the most information about our program. And so on this webinar, I am just synthesizing that. Um, so I'm breaking it down by section, but. Um, uh, that RFA will give you the most level of detail. And of course, we're happy to answer any questions. Next slide. Um, in the RFA, we have a, a, a glossary um, and we found this to be really important to be able to ensure that we are on the same uh, uh, page in regards to the definitions. So when we're talking about prevention, we really are thinking about uh, the broadest understanding and definition around prevention. So really thinking critically about um, healthy uh, uh, protective factors um, to be able to uh, build uh, the resiliency and supports for young people, as well as thinking about how to reduce risk factors. Um, and then I'll jump into two of the particular definitions on the next two slides. Um, but again, uh, we do encourage you to visit the RFA to be able to ensure that your understanding and definition of these terms aligns with where we are with the program. Next slide. So substance use disorder prevention. Um, again, we, we look at prevention as the broadest definition of prevention. And so this is, again, promoting healthy behaviors reducing risks and building protective factors. So not just thinking about, you know, only focusing on substance use disorder education, but um, also being able to implement through your program, how do you promote healthy behaviors? How do you build protective factors that have been, um, that, that the youth and young adults in your program have been impacted by um, through the war on drugs or other policy and uh, systems impacts that have related, um, that have caused issues in particular communities. So really thinking about that specifically with the communities that you're working with. And then harm reduction aiming to reduce at-risk, moderate, and high-risk behaviors often associated with substance misuse. And so really also thinking about um, harm reduction. So we don't want you to turn away young people who are using or engaging in substances. We want you to be able to work with them and be able to um, determine how to how do you best reduce harm with young people who are using as well. Next slide. The other key piece um, to this program is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, it is a social justice youth development program. And so when we think about social justice youth development, we're really thinking about young people being centered in um, the policy systems and environmental change that uh, your program is promoting. And so um, again, thinking about communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, and we build upon the positive youth development framework to be able to address those social factors that young people are facing, especially as they develop in adulthood. And so, you know, some of these examples are around youth-led organizing, student activism, um, campaigns to address our school or community concern, and then being able to really address policy change um, that young people are leading. So again, not just that your organization is, is engaging in policy or systems change, the key component of this program is, is that young people ages 12 to 26 are the, the leaders of these programs. They're the ones who are implementing uh, the, the policy change that are, are leading the efforts to engage in policy and systems change. Next slide. Some of our guiding values, again, we invest in youth empowerment, leadership, and, in develop, and development. And I cannot stress enough that um, your proposal should definitely include a way, um, it should address um, young people uh, leading the program as well as being centered in the work. And so later through the um, RFA, we'll share particular ways in which we uh, try to uh, 
uh, enhance uh, youth being centered in, in the program, but there aren't the only ways. And so again, as you're thinking about your program, please think about um, the program design with young people in mind and um, where ways in which they can be leaders in the program as well. And we also want to ensure that we're implementing programs through the cultural lens of the impacted community. You know, every community is unique um, and has cultural, linguistic, um, various factors that impact their community. And we want to make sure that we're thinking about uh, that cultural lens as well. And so it's important to be able to ensure, and we'll mention even in the application, you'll see sort of a reflection of your staff and, and, and board. And we want to make sure that your st staff and board reflect the community that you're serving. You know, um, it's, it's critical to ensure that, you know, those who are implementing the program from your staff, from those consultants, various sort of pe people who are engaged in your program, um, those adult mentors, they are able to understand what the youth and young adult are going through. And um, typically, that, that does, it does really help when you, um, those staff members are coming from uh, communities that the young people are, are direct, that they're directly working with. The other piece is around promotion of population level impacts. And so we do this through policy systems and environmental change. It's where the, the, the need for having a multi-year program comes into play. And so we know that policy and system change isn't always possible in a short period of time. And sometimes it might not even be possible in the three year period. Um, but oftentimes it, it can be, um, and we want to be mindful of being able to sort of to see those population level impacts through policy systems and environmental change. And so the uh, chart on the bottom has, you know, sort of the various levels of the socio uh, ecological system. So, you know, looking at individuals, the various factors that impact them at their interpersonal level. So their, their experiences in early childhood development, other sorts of violence or abuse that they might have um, faced, or even um, young uh, family members that might have um, issues with substance use. And then we go through beyond at the community level, thinking about their connectedness with their community. We know that's a social determinant of, of health and um, also uh, um, access to health and social services. And then, you know, thinking about also the availability of and access to substances as well, thinking about how, you know, various uh, uh, substance uh, substance providers. Um, so now if you think about sort of the marketing that's done to young people as well, and we can intentionally see how in certain neighborhoods, um, as well as on social media, um, you know, the marketing that is done of substances is, is deliberately targeting select groups of people and particularly in certain neighborhoods. And then we kind of go beyond to the societal structural level, you know, again, sort of the marketing practices, um, you know, looking at the intergenerational trauma, the stigma and discrimination and thinking about that even in, in seeking care and services. And so when we when you're building out your program, we really encourage you to think about each of these levels um, to be able to advance um, population level impacts through your policy systems or environmental change goal that you're going to propose in your application. Next slide. And so, um, again, we're seeking applications from community-based organizations, tribal organizations, this can include 638s as well as urban clinics and county behavioral um, health organizations. Um, the key piece around the county behavioral health organizations is that you are the sole provider um, of the prevention services in your county. And we do have a list of this, so we will, we will share that as well um, for any of the counties that have a question around this. Um, but we're really looking for organizations um, that strive for health equity and will work on specific cultural and linguistically appropriate prevention. So again, really thinking about the specific, um, you know, youth that you're going to be working it with and understanding their cultural and linguistic services that they need and be, um, and, and be able to propose a program that fits that as well. And it can also include outreach and education projects, again, that are uh, addressing policy systems and environmental change that is youth led um, in our particular age range is youth ages 12 to 26. So youth and young adults. The project period is three years. So it'll start November 16th, 2023 and continue on to November 15th, 2026. Um, we don't anticipate um, contracts needing to be backdated, but in the case that there are delays, contracts will be backdated. And so the, the program will, will still start November 16th, 2023. Next slide. This slide has, um, you know, the, the intentionality around why we focus on particular communities and who those communities are that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. And so 
on the left, we see um, data from 2015 around the raw numbers around drug offenses. And so we see a disproportionate rate um, across. And so we know that Black and African American populations in California do not comprise an equal number to, to the white populations, but yet we still see a discrepancy there in terms of uh, the raw number of 24, when we know that the Black and African-American populations in California are a lot lower than those um, that are white. And we see an uptake in, in sort of those uh, drug offenses for Hispanic Latinx populations. And so we, we know that the um, war on drugs intentionally uh, targeted communities of color um, so Black, uh, uh, Black African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, as well as Indigenous and Native communities. And so we want to ensure that we're rooting this program back to intentionally support those communities. And it goes beyond just those communities. We also are focusing on 2S LGBTQ plus communities as well. And so on the right, we see figure 16, which talks about or which shows the um, racial disparities in the marijuana um, possession arrests. Um, in from 20, 2010. And so, you know, you see clearly a disproportionate um, rate in terms of black arrest rates versus white arrest rates. So, um, you know, there might be some questions around, you know, why is this particularly focusing on certain communities? And the, the, the reality is, is that the impact that the war on drugs has has still um, uh, still has impacted those communities that were disproportionately impacted. And so when we think about um, you know, uh, the harm that was done, um, even if we think about from, from, that, from the war on drugs, we wanna make sure that we're very intentional of being able to see that that harm has continued on beyond just that policy period. Next slide. And your involvement. We could not do this work without you. Um, so we are so grateful that you're on this webinar, you're listening to it later, and you've gone through our RFA, um, and you're considering applying. You are able to allow us to reach into specified geographies, so in different parts of the state, um, and to also understand um, the communities that you're looking to serve. Your staff, your, your board, your leadership reflect the communities and young people that you're serving, and you have an understanding of their experiences. You also have trusted partnerships. Um, you know, with other organizations, other businesses, other sort of entities within your local region as well. And also you're able to um, develop a successful approach for community prevention and education. And so oftentimes, um, you know, we'll get a number of questions around, you know, what makes us more competitive? And if we did this approach, would it be more competitive versus this approach? And what I will say is, is that we trust you all in the work that you're proposing as you all are the experts in this work, given your experience working with youth and young adults in your local region. So we cannot thank you enough. And again, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're excited that you're considering to apply for this funding opportunity. Next slide. You go into eligibility. So this is, um, as, as Jessica mentioned earlier, this uh, the funding does come from Proposition 64, um, the uh, State Cannabis Tax Fund. And so uh, we, we do require that organizations are located in California and that your services are provided in California as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 501c3 community-based organizations, tribal organizations, which include the 638s as well as the urban clinics and county behavioral health organizations are eligible to apply. If you don't fit one of these um, buckets, then uh, you are able to apply through a fiscal sponsorship. And so these are open to coalition. Um, uh, we'll jump into this in terms of uh, the fiscal sponsors a little bit later in the application, but let's say you're an organization that hasn't yet secured your 501c3 status, you do have a fiscal sponsor with another eligible entity, you're able to do that, apply through that means. We've also gotten some questions from county behavioral health agencies around, you know, they're not the sole provider in the county, but can they partner with um, a CBO? Yes, you can also subcontract out or, or partner with another lead entity um, that is eligible to apply. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Also coalitions and um, of organizations or collaboratives are also eligible to apply. The key piece here is, is that the backbone organization is the eligible is an eligible can, um, applicant. So you'll wanna make sure whoever is the lead applicant um, is eligible through the eligibility criteria. Applicant organizations must not have an active Elevate Youth California grant. So if you're um, an EYC funded partner on this call or listening to this webinar, 
and your award is not going to end in November 2023, um, you're you're not eligible to apply. But our organize our funded partners who do end their awards either in August 2023 or November 2023, you are eligible to apply. A specific email has been sent out to those organizations who are eligible. The only case where this, um, where if you have an Elevate Youth California grant, um, you're eligible to apply if, you're the, if you are a fiscal sponsor. So we have some organizations who, you know, do serve as fiscal sponsors for um, various other um, uh, community-based organizations. And so this would be um, the only exception to that. But uh, a current awarded funded partner who's going to go beyond November 2023 um, would not be eligible unless they were a fiscal sponsor. Next slide. In turn, um, continuing on with the eligibility criteria, again, we really want to make sure that your organization has um, uh, experience partnering with young people of color and those that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. And so, again, thinking very critically about the populations that you're working with and ensuring that you have that track record. Um, we are also looking for organizations and collaborative partners to deeply engage and reflect those proposed communities. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we, we do ask about your staff and uh, board uh, makeup and, and being able to ensure that, you know, your staff and your board does reflect the communities that you're proposing to work with. Additionally, um, we do uh, we do require that all of our funded partners or all of the applicants have demonstrated evidence of inclusivity, and so you're not discriminating. Um, on this slide, it has a list of um, uh, sort of different factors that can be discriminated. And again, really looking for organizations that are inclusive as well. Next slide. Implementation strategies. So as I shared, this is a social justice youth development program. So um, a key component of it is youth activism. And so we do require um, youth activism to be a part of your program. The work plan does ask for a specific policy systems environmental change goal that you're going to look to accomplish. And then we do um, give you the option of either of having at least one either mentorship relationship um, building or peer led support and leadership programs. And some organizations select both. Um, so they select all three of these, um, and some will have either mentorship, so adult um, youth mentorship program, or a way to be able to uh, um, have adult uh, youth relationship building incorporated in their plan, uh, in their proposed uh, uh, activities, or they'll look to have peer-led support, so peer-to-peer -peer mentorship programs and leadership programs. Um, you know, I will just mention that some folks say, well, will I be more competitive if I do all three? No, not necessarily. Again, we really want you to think about what your program, um, how it will be best situated and that design of it. So if you select two of these, you're are th all three of these, you're not like you're not going to be more competitive than someone who only selects two. Again, it's really intentionally building your program to ensure that the key aspects of it um, do align with uh, with the young people that you're working with. Next uh, slide. Some of our examples of uh, funded activities um, are listed here. There's more listed also. There's more uh, examples of the particular uh, uh, design of programs and examples of that as well on the um, uh, in the RFA. We do support direct services. Again, policy system change uh, is a key component of the program. You know, thinking about healing centered work as well. And so I invite all of our applicants to really think about work that's culturally rooted and healing centered. Um, peer-led capacity building, training, and leadership development, policy-focused campaigns, as well as youth-led programming and credible messenger outreach programs. These are just a, a few examples. Again, more examples are listed in the RFA. Next slide. Um, award amount. So I think there's been a few questions. It is up, is it, uh, up to a million dollars for three years. So you can apply for a total of up to a million dollars over the course of the three years. So it's not a million dollars each year. It is for the three year period, a um, million dollars. Just wanted to reiterate that. And I know that was a question in the um, chat as well. Next slide. If you're awarded, it is a responsive payment schedule. So we do try to keep in mind that the upfront cost um, of uh, building out the program, so it's not reimbursable based, um, it is uh, responsive. So it would be a um, minimum of three payments. And typically what we um, do is that once the contract has been executed, if you're selected, we'll issue a contract as well as share the insurance requirements, which the insurance requirements are also at the end of the RFA at this time. But once you secure uh, your insurance requirements, as well as the contract 
contract is uh, uh, successfully completed or executed, um, we'll go ahead and issue that first payment. And the first payment typically ends up being your year one budget. And then we'll, um, in the past, what we've done is, is we've um, at the end of year two, beginning of year three, um, sorry, at the, at the end of year one, we'll go ahead and once all of the deliverables are submitted, um, your financial report, detailed expenditure listing, all of that is confirmed. We are able to approve uh, those uh, deliverables for the first year. We'll go ahead and look to make that second payment. So it is responsive um, based, it is not reimbursed. Next slide. And just some additional pieces, we do support um, up to 85% of uh, the uh, work done in this um, program will be for uh, urban communities and 15% or more will be uh, supported through um, rural, for rural communities. And we do invite you to look at the RFA um, there is a link that uh, allows you to have that specific definition, as well as a link that will um, allow you to know if you're uh, serving in an area that is rural or urban. The um, grants will be deliverable based, and I believe the next slide may have the deliverables um, listed. And so, again, that responsive payment is, is based on those deliverables, the quarterly progress reports, the financial report, the end of year report, all of that. Next slide. And as I shared, the reporting and data requirements. So you do, we do ask that funded partners um, submit quarterly progress reports at this time, um, and, and and end of year report um, each uh, November or each early December. Sorry, and then you'll have your financial report that's due annually as well, which will also include a detailed expenditure listing. And this continues on throughout the end of the through the end of the program, which you'll then submit a final uh, cumulative final report as well as cumulative financial report. This table is also included on um, the in the RFA itself. Next slide. You know, I mentioned earlier one of the ways we've uh, built our um, we've in the program we've uh, we've built some ways in which um, uh, organizations are able to uh, continue to center youth voices. And one of the ways we do this is we require a minimum of one youth listening session um, each year. Um, of the program. Um, and so over the course of your program, you'll need to implement three, a minimum of uh, three, so uh, annual youth listening sessions. Youth listening sessions, um, some folks talk about, uh, use the term uh, healing circle or even um, a focus group. It's really an intentional opportunity to be able to hear from young people, youth and young adults who are in your program or those who you might want to reach um, to be able to get their feedback on their strategy and project implementation. We've seen some organizations do this at the beginning of the program. Um, so just as they're kicked out, as they kick off, they'll be able to talk about, you know, the program that they're pitching. You know, they'll be able to get feedback on uh, policy system change. Really, again, an intentional opportunity to hear from young people. Um, while only one is required, organizations um, have uh, implemented more than one annually as well. And you would need to note this in your application. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to pause for questions. Um, I'm going to try to quickly pull up um, the uh, questions real quick. Um, there is a question around the um, count, the requirement for counties um, around being a sole provider of services. What we'll do is, is um, we'll go ahead and have an FAQ document, but we'll drop it before the end of the call the, in the chat as well. Um, the specific counties um, that uh, DHCS has provided around being the sole providers. Um, but again, this is where those prevention services are, are done um, through your county agency specifically. Um, another question that came is, is do you have staff attend one community-wide events on occasion, um, site visits? Um, yes, this is a great question. We um, we are in partnership with our funded partners, and so while at times site visits are conducted as more of an evaluative approach, we really do take it as a partnership. So we might do site visits as a learning opportunity to be able to to see how your program is working um, and to to be able to have a better understanding of it. Um, we again in partnership, we will notify you in advance. And again, um, in the case that it is. Um, something more around quality assurance, um, we will also notify you on that end. But we often like to attend um, and participate in progr um, uh, the programmatic events, of course, uh, with a statewide program. And us being located in Sacramento, we can't make it out to all of our funded partners events, but we, we do like to have a presence and just to be able to, again, be in partnership with our funded partners. 
Um, there's another question. Um, we're currently funded partner. Are we allowed to submit an application with the same scope of work? Does the scope of work in relation to this RFA need to be different and or new? Um, so this is a great question. Um, so we don't require uh, a sort of different approach to the work that you're doing. So if you're if you are currently funded partner of the Elevate Youth California program and you've had some great success and want to continue that program, you're more than welcome to apply with that in mind. Um, you know, uh, from the time of the application in round two to now, the, um, the program has overarchingly stayed the same. Uh, again, you will need to make sure that you're reading the questions to make sure that you're answering them correctly. And, and sort of those have definitely changed, um, as well as ensure um, any of the changes to the work plan. So again, we do off, we do want to invite our funded partners um, who, who have already been funded through Elevate Youth California to think about the improvements that can also be done through their program. So if there's some, some changes that, you're like, that you'd like to make, this is really that opportunity to be able to propose them as well. But we do not have any um, requirements around new programs. And that also goes for organizations who are applying for programs um, or a program that they may have already started to implement. Um, and you're looking to have it be proposed for this um, uh, funding opportunity. We do not require that you have to have a new program. Again, it can be already an existing program. Of course, with the additional funding, there's probably going to be some enhancements that are made, um, uh, you know, being able to reach a higher number of youth, those sort of pieces. So um, it's important to include that as well. Um, there's a technical piece around. Can you please enable participants to copy save the chat? Um, so we can save those links. I think that might be an error that I'm not sure if it can be changed or not, but if it can, my team will make note of it. Um, I will also just mention that um, the links that we're sharing, um, any of the links that we from the EYC team shares, we'll also go ahead and have them to the um, linked on our website. Um, and they are also uh, included in the RFA. So, um, the main link, if you can get to our website on the news section, the RFA is listed there, as well as the online portal is listed in the RFA itself. Um, so just wanted to mention that, but our, I'll try to see if our team can support um, with that. Um, there's some questions in the chat around, like, you know, uh, I think if, if you're in cohort two, can you apply? Again, if your award is ending November 2023, um, you are eligible to apply for the for the round five funding opportunity. Um, there's another question around, will a county office of education be classified as an eligible organization? Unfortunately, no. Um, a county office of education is not um, uh, an eligible organization for this funding opportunity. Can Elevate Youth Capacity Building non- funded partner on a coalition apply on their own with the university. Um, I think there might need to be some greater clarity. So Sandy, I'd invite you to go ahead and either send us an email or to elaborate on this. I would I would ask that you send us an email. It would be helpful to be able to get greater context um, um, on this to make sure that you're eligible. Um, there is a question around, so a university that's a 501c3 eligible. Um, we would also invite you to email us to confirm eligibility. Um, we have funded um, one you know, uh, university program, but again, it's because the uh, department that was within the organize or within the university was eligible. Um, uh, so I would just again invite Jennifer as well to go ahead and send us an email to confirm eligibility on that. Um, we do currently encourage and support youth activism. Could you provide more information about youth-led in initiatives and whether it's feasible to invite involve the youth we serve in our current campaigns, particularly focused on immigrant and POC communities, given that our organization is already engaged in multiple coalitions and campaigns. Um, so when we're talking about youth-led initiatives, it's really ensuring that youth are the ones who are leading those policy systems and environmental change um, goals. And so, for example, if you're looking to go ahead and um, address school suspension policies, um, you know, be able to sort of shift um, some of that around not having um, young people be suspended or expelled and spending more time outside of school. You know, if that is your goal, for example, it would be making sure that young people are centered in that work and they're leading that work. So they're the ones who are determining sort of the um, power mapping of, of, of the school board. They're able to determine the power mapping of uh, individuals who are a part of that uh, change and how to be able to accomplish it. 
they're being trained on how to speak at uh, school board meetings um, and also being able to um, lead and drive those campaigns. So when we think about youth led initiatives, again, really thinking about youth having an active role in creating the policy systems and environmental change goal. Um, will we be receiving a copy of this presentation? Yes, the presentation will be posted on the website along with the recording we anticipate, if not by the end of this week, early next week. Um, another question around, we serve a very large geographic area that includes several urban and several rural areas. We're not sure which category to apply in. Well, you're in luck. There's an option to go ahead and select both urban and rural on the application. And when Shira um, uh, covers the application, you'll be able to see that specifically. Um, can youth participants be, stay, be paid or stipended? Um, yes, youth participants can be compensated. Um, you would need to um, include this in the budget justification to be able to elaborate on how uh, that compensation is happening. Can you clarify how often the two-day in-person convenings will occur? Will they occur every project year? So um, the two, we're, we're asking that you submit for two two-day in-person convenings. Um, so we don't have the details as of right now. Um, but I would say it would be good to budget out for three to five um, individuals to be able to attend that two day um, in person convening in Sacramento as of right now. So it would be best to budget again and we'll include this in the um, FAQ document as well. There will be two two day convenings. Um, so, um, you know, if you wanted to put them in year one and year two, that works. Um, or if you wanted to put them in year two and three, that's also fine. But um, that uh, in person convening will have more information after the launch of the program. What would be the source of referrals? Would high schools refer youth? Um, in terms of referrals, if I'm understanding this question, this would really be on how you're recruiting, re recruiting youth. We mentioned referrals in the application or in the RFA, but for a different reason. But to clarify this question, um, this would be in regards to how you're working with youth. And our hope is, is that you already have a track record and base for working with young people. So there are already um, young people that your, your organization is working with. Um, but of course, um, uh, organizations expand uh, their, their youth that they're working with. So this is done through recruitment strategies that could also include um, youth uh, referring other young people, as well as um, uh, working with schools to be able to have young people referred into programs. Um, can you give examples? Um, given timing on, in regards to PSE change, um, I, I mentioned some earlier around the school board policy. Um, there's others around uh, safe spaces, so uh, being able to have parks and other green spaces in neighborhoods. Um, this really varies, and again, it's really important for the youth-led policy systems change to be um, in alignment with the young people you're working with. Um, and there's a, a handful of examples that are also listed in the um, uh, RFA as well. Are we allowed to add additional items to the budget template? Um, yes, I believe you should be able to. And if you have additional line items, you are more than welcome to update them in the miscellaneous section. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause there um, because there's a handful of other questions and I wanna make sure we get through all of the material in the presentation and we'll come back to the questions at the very end or at the next time we pause. So next slide. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Shira. Okay, thank you. So um, at this time, we'll take a moment to review the application located on the Center's Grants Portal. Uh, the Center's Grants Portal is where the application is completed and submitted. And then after taking a look at the contents of the application, we will cover the required attachments. We want to reiterate um, that the application must be submitted through our portal. Um, if your organization um, does not have technology um, or you're having um, some challenges with the portal, we request that you contact us as soon as possible and we'll work with you on another uh, method of submission. Um, we also want to share that the link to the application is found within the request for applications and we have um, shared it in the chat. Looks like one of my colleagues have placed it in there. So feel free to follow along with me. Um, at this time, I'm going to share my screen and we will walk through the application together. Okay. 
Okay, so at this point, um, we should all be looking at um, the application and it says um, Elevate Youth California round five standard track. At the top of the application, there are a few reminders. Um, the first is just a note to be sure to read the request for applications before you get started on the online application. Another is a reminder to reach out to our team um, if you have any questions or if you experience any technical difficulties. Um, and then um, it's a note saying that after submission, you will receive an email confirmation. Um, the email confirmation will have a PDF of the application that you have submitted. If you believe that you have submitted the application and you did not receive an email, um, then contact our team and we'll look into um, it for you. So the application starts off by collecting some um, basic information. The information that's filled out in this section My screen just went blank. Okay, is everyone there? I think so. Yeah, we can see. Okay, them. okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. My screen just blacked out quickly. Um, so the information that you will provide here um, will be for the qualifying organization. So if your organization has a fiscal sponsor, that means that the fiscal sponsor's information uh, will go into the section. Um, and if not, uh, you will go ahead and put in the, the information for the qualifying organization. So as I shared, just some basic information here. And this, if you have a fiscal sponsor, the fiscal sponsor's information goes here. As we scroll down, um, there's some questions around the organization status. So does the organization have 501c3 nonprofit status with the IRS? You will answer yes, no, or unsure. There's a question regarding um, whether or not there are audits. And then um, this question here is asking about the legal um, entity that the organization is. As we move down to the next section. Sorry, Sorry to interrupt. We have a request in the chat asking for you to make the application a tad bit bigger. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I've gone ahead and increased the magnification. So hopefully it's a little bit better. Um, I will note that we will be sharing the slides to this presentation and this the slide set will also contain screenshots of what I'm currently reviewing. So the next section of the application asks for the information for the director, the CEO contact. And so if this is a fiscally sponsored um, project, then the fiscal sponsor's information goes here. Okay. Moving on to the next question. It says, is the project uh, sponsored by the applicant organization? So if you have a fiscal sponsor, you would enter yes. And once you select yes, you'll be able to enter in information on the fiscally sponsored entity. So this fiscally sponsored entity is the, the org that is leading the work. So the lead implementation um, agency. So if the project does not have a fiscal sponsor, just select no and continue on with the application. Next, the application asks for the primary project contact information. So it's here that you are able to indicate another person that um, our team can, can contact if there are questions about the application. So we certainly encourage you to list um, a primary contact if you have one. And if the primary contact will remain the CEO or the director of the organization, then you can just um, select that option. Next, you'll be asked to provide project information. So you'll provide a name of your project. You'll provide a purpose statement for your project. We ask that you begin that statement with the word to. You will enter in the amount requested next. And so there's a note here that awards for this opportunity will not exceed 1 million. The project start date and end date are already entered. You can see that this project is um, for three years. And next, the application asks for the proposed implementation strategy um, as previously shared youth activism for policy system and environmental change is required. And um, you also have the option to select mentorship relationship building if that's a part of your, your project or peer led support and leadership program. There is a note to select at least two. 
The next area of the application is project geography. And so this is the area of the application where you will share where activities are taking place. So if you're we do ask for this information as a percentage. So let's say, um, you know, say you're located in Alameda County, since it's the first one here. If all of the activities are taking place in Alameda County, you would put 100%. And you'll, you can scroll down and see that um, the total geography percentage calculates here. The total geography percentage must equal 100. If it does not, you will receive a note. If you're doing, um, leading activities in more than one county, then be sure to identify those counties and the percentage of efforts um, in those counties in this area of the application. Each county in California is listed here. Okay, moving on to the next part of the application, it's rural or, or urban. So you will um, indicate whether the proposed project is um, being implemented in a rural area an urban area or both. There are definitions uh, for each of these categories located within the RFA. The next area is race and ethnicity. So think about the, the uh, populations who will be served. And we are asking that you indicate the percentage um, of those of each population um, in this area. If uh, the population who your project serves is not listed, you do have the option to select um, another race or ethnicity. So be sure to um, use that if you don't see a population listed, and then you can enter in that population's um, name or title into this section right here. Um, as with geography, the total percentage must equal 100, or you will likely receive an error message. The next area of the application is age group. So uh, this is asking who the project will serve. And so we ask that you um, indicate that um, using percentages. There's also a reminder here that this specific funding opportunity um, is for youth ages 12 to 26 years of age. The next area of the application is additional areas of focus. And so it's here where you will select any of the following populations that are primary focus of the project. We ask that you not just you know, select every single one, but really think about um, who the project will reach, who the project is reaching, and um, being sure that you let us know how your services are tailored to meet their needs um, in the narrative section. The next uh, question asks about the racial ethnic uh, makeup of the board and staff. So it's here that we learn um, about who is leading the work um, and also organizational leadership. Um, we're just seeing if there is a correlation between um, if the, excuse me, the staff or board is reflective of the youth who are being served. So here's where you will let us know more about that. And then the next section of the application is narrative questions. Um, we encourage you to um, write out your narrative questions, maybe in a separate document. And once the narrative section is finalized, transfer those over. Um, but um, it's up to you. But that's a, that is definitely one tip that we like to share. Um, so narrative questions will be around the organization description, need, the population description, um, culturally and linguistically appropriate services, so you can share more about that, your project goals, your project activities, monitoring and evaluation, your track record with the proposed project activities and policy change. Uh-oh, let me scroll up a little bit. My mouse is just not behaving today. Um, the next session, in the next section, you can describe partnerships, the qualifications of the project team, and technical assistance. Technical assistance is where um, you will share with us the supports that you need, um, that you help, that you believe will help you to be successful in your project. The next area of the application is attachments. And so there are a few areas of this section that I want to quickly point out. And we'll take a look at each one in just a moment. So the first one is the three-year project budget. 
um, you can see right here where it says this link. When you click that, um, another uh, tab will open up and it will have the required budget template. So once that pops up, be sure to download it. And there's also a note for the type of file that will be accepted. So when you are submitting the budget, you know, please submit it as an Excel file. And so if you have any difficulty with that, let our team know. The next um, option or the next uh, attachment that is required is a budget justification. This is where you will download it at this link here. And please note the file types that we um, are requesting, either a Word document or a PDF. Next is the W-9. Um, please be sure to upload a signed W-9. And um, another attachment is the work plan. So there is a work plan required for this funding opportunity. Here is where you will download the template. Um, and for this particular um, requirement, we have provided an example. So if you want to see the example, you would click this link below and you would be able to see an example of a completed work plan. We ask that work plans be submitted as a Word document or a PDF document. Now, when it comes time to upload um, your attachments, once they are ready to go, you would select choose file. You would locate that file on your computer, and then you would um, upload it to the application. So it's the same for each of these. Once you select Choose File, you will be able to upload it to the application. Um, and then below this, let's see, I'll scroll down, is a, a letter of support. So a letter of support is required. We're asking that this is signed by the applicant organization's executive. Um, if you are applying as a coalition, the support letter should be signed by each coalition member stating their role in the project. And also it should be signed uh, by uh, the organization's executive. In the letter of support, please affirm um, your ability to submit quarterly data and financial progress reports. Um, please affirm um, your ability to participate in external evaluation activities, as well as participation in two in-person convenings. And as uh, noted in the other sections, the type of file that we are requesting is noted, and that is a PDF form. Now, one thing that I believe I forgot to mention, um, before we dive into attachments, is that this application does not um, require an, an account. So you do not have to set up an account um, to be able to submit an application. But at the very top of the application, and I apologize for this oversight because I should have covered this earlier, but at the very top of the application, you do have the option to save progress and resume later. So once you click this button, another, um, a uh, box will, will open up. You'll be able to provide an email, a password of your choice, and then you would confirm that password, and then you would hit save. When you hit save, that will prompt an email to be sent to you with a link um, to the application so that you can um, go back and revisit it or continue to work on it um, as you're um, going through the submission process. So at this time, we're going to take a quick look at each of the attachments. We're going to start with the budget. So I'm switching my screen over to the budget template. So this is a three-year budget template. I'm going to quickly circle um, each of the years so that they stand out a little bit more. Here's year one, year two, year three, and then there's a section that says total, and this is where the cumulative totals for each of the three years will combine, and you'll see totals there. Now, within each year, there are three columns. The first column is the total project budget. Um, you will not need to enter any data into this budget. Um, this, into this column, excuse me, this particular column will calculate totals from this column and this column automatically. Okay. So in year one, you see that there's a column for requested from the center. So this is how much you are requesting uh, for this uh, application. And then the next uh, column here asks for other funding committed to the project. And this represents any in-kind of funding that may also go towards the project that you are proposing. On the far left-hand side, um, this is where you will enter in um, each of the line items for your budget. So you can see the first one is personnel. So we ask you to list um, 
each of the you know, positions that will be funded um, and the costs associated with that. We're also asking for the FTE of each of those. So if it's a full-time position, what we look for is 1.0. FTE. So that's a full-time position. If the position was part-time or let's say half-time, you would enter 0.5. Okay. So once you have your personnel and your salaries um, in there, we're also wanting to highlight that we request payroll taxes and benefits. Sometimes this is overlooked. Um, if you have any consultant fees, um, be sure to list those consultants down here and the fees associated with those services. Um, then you'll be able to add other um, expenses. So you'll see some expenses have been itemized for you already. And then if you have expenses that are not listed here, you can write those in um, in lines four through eight. Also, there is um, an area for your indirect rate. And so these are for some of your indirect costs. And we want you to note that indirect costs can be up to 20% of the direct costs. You'll see 10% listed here as a default, but you can go in and manually change that. Okay, so after you have uh, completed your budget, we definitely encourage you to review it, make sure that your totals are adding up, that you have the amounts that you're requesting from the center. Um, if you have any in-kind support, that you're highlighting that for each of your, your program years, and then uh, being sure that your cumulative totals for all three years are adding up in the um, total column. At this point, we'll quickly take a look at the budget justification. So the budget justification is where you will share more about the line items in your budget. So it asks for you to state the amounts requested by year and then the grand total. And then there are some instructions um, by category. So salaries here, you'll be able to do a breakdown of the, the staffing positions that are proposed. You'll be able to share a little bit more about those positions, payroll taxes and benefits, the consultant fees. Here is an area where you can share more about the consultants that you're intending to engage with and um, how they will um, work with you on this project. There's other expenses that you can share more about. Um, rent, utilities, equipment, travel, miscellaneous. Your youth listening sessions are also here, so be sure to share more about the costs associated with your listening sessions, travel to in-person convenings, and then you can provide more detail on the indirect costs. Uh, moving on, we'll take a quick look at the work plan. Um, so a work plan is required for this opportunity. As shared before, we do have an example of a completed work plan located within the application. So we won't spend a whole lot of time here, um, but in a nutshell, um, you'll provide your organization name, the grant period, um, the priority area and population. So that's where you will let us know who your um, project will reach. Um, you will share a problem statement. So that is the, the community concern or issue that your project will, uh, will address. Um, you'll talk about contributing factors. So what are some of the um, items that contribute to the, the problem that your project will be addressing? You'll state your program goal and you'll state your policy goal. Um, below that are some quick tips on how to write objectives for the work plan. We ask that you use SMART criteria um, when writing your objectives, making sure that the objectives are SMART, excuse me, are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time, and time bound. And we have some examples. Within the work plan, there are two main se sections. So one will be for your programmatic objectives. Here, your programmatic objective is very similar to a goal. And so you'll write that here. You'll write the supporting activities that will lead to um, the successful completion of the ob objective. You'll list out the responsible staff partners and you'll enter in a start date and an end date for each activity. Also, we ask that you um, provide information on monitoring and evaluation. So how are you going to monitor uh, the, the objective activities and the objective itself? How will you know that you've been successful? So you can share more information about that. Then as you scroll down, 
There's another section for your policy systems and environmental uh, change objectives. So be sure to provide a, a, your PSC goal, the activities that will lead to that goal, who's responsible, a timeline, and your monitoring and evaluation approach. So at this time, we've covered the three of the main attachments for this application. I'm going back to the application itself. The Remaining um, attachments will need to be provided by you, and that is the sign W-9 and the support letter as previously shared. Also, just want to give another note um, and reminder to be sure to submit the application. So once you've completed it, be sure to submit it and definitely reach out to our team if you have any questions. At this time, I will go ahead and pause, and I think that we can resume the slide set. Thanks so much, Shira. As we do that, I'm going to go ahead and try to get through some of the questions. Um, for county behavioral health departments, are you looking for uh, our department statistics or board of supervisors makeup when you ask board makeup? Um, so for county behavioral health agencies, you can do it of just your department, um, of, of the department staff. Um, so we uh, do ask that you have it for your, your department understanding that the larger makeup of the county behavioral um, health department's board or board of supervisors is very different and they wouldn't be um, engaged much in the program. But um, so for county behavioral health departments, again, just you can include um, the department statistics. So the makeup of your uh, staff that are in that specific particular department. Um, does the youth activism need to be specific in the application and the first several months dedicated to identifying the activism activity? This is a great question especially when folks might be asking, well, you know, you're mentioning that you want youth to be centered, you want youth to lead this program, we're pitching a, a policy. Um, how does that really align with that? So we have seen organizations go ahead and identify in their work plan that they are going to work with young people. Um, some uh, organizations do go ahead and select um, a broad policy goal that they're gonna work on and then mention in the work plan or the application that they're gonna go ahead, they might be looking to change that. That's totally fine. Um, you know, we invite you to determine how you want to best proceed with that. But if you do have an idea um, or you want to go ahead and list some, um, a, a, or propose a policy goal to, that you're going to work on, you can include it in your, act, um, your work plan and your application. Um, but if you are planning to utilize the first few months um, determining that policy goal with the young people in mind, um, then it is important that you identify how you plan to do that. So that's where the beauty of the work plan comes in. You have the opportunity to go ahead and list your activities as well. Um, again, I do encourage you to uh, go ahead and even propose a potential policy goal. Um, again, you can add in that, you know, this is a potential goal, but you're going to revisit it with the youth um, and young adults once they start the program. Um, another question, will the application evaluation process and scoring rubric be shared? This is a great question. We do have in the RFA itself, there is a um, section that is around selection and uh, um, selection and el that's not eligibility criteria. Now I'm blanking out. I had it pulled in just a second ago. Um, it is a selection and evaluation criteria. So it is on page 13 of the RFA or it starts on page 13. It has a breakdown of exactly what we're looking at for each question. Again, for each question, we're not, you know, um, we are, we made these questions as straightforward as possible. So what I would really encourage you to do is, is read the question back, make sure that your response answers each part of that question. Um, the selection and evaluation criteria, again, that begins on page 13. Um, does break that down. So what are we looking at in terms of that? What is that additional criteria? So we invite you to go ahead and um, again, uh, see, uh, see that in the RFA itself. Um, another question that was asked is, um, how would you say the center prioritizes numbers served or impact? I know both would be ideal, but wanted to get a sense um, of what would be considered more favorable. This is a great question. What I will say is, is that overarchingly, Quality over quantity is always um, uh, prioritized. Um, the, the key piece here I will mention is, is that, you know, you might propose a certain number of young people, and this is where it becomes really important to be able to make sure your, um, not only your goals are smart, but also the objectives and activities that you're listing are also um, smart. So again, being specific, 
how many younger, how many number of young people you're going to be working with is important to include on your um, work plan. What's also important is how frequently you plan to work with them. You know, if you have an idea of whether this is going to be a weekly, multi -time, multiple times a week, um, you know, what that programmatic design is going to look like, or the number of times you plan to meet with young people over the course of the year, even, um, that would be very helpful to include. And is I cannot encourage you enough um, to be able to include as much of that information as possible as you are completing your work plan. So that allows us to see, um, you know, beyond sort of the number of young people you're working with, what does your program actually look like? So if we have a question of, you know, you propose, let's say 20 youth um, to, to work with, and you're asking for a million dollars, it might be a question of, you know, how frequently is this organization working with those youth? What exactly are those activities? And so for us on our end, it'll be very important that your narrative of your application, your budget and budget justification, as well as work plan align. So it'll allow us to be able to see what you're proposing in your application and your work plan and be able to ensure that the budget and budget justification aligns. Now, you might be working with a smaller number of young people and uh, uh, request a smaller amount of funding as well. And that is totally fine. Again, we ask that you are very mindful of the program that you're pitching and the activities that it will take as well as the cost and, and sort of the budget that you're requesting. That is very critical um, to be able to um, justify those costs in, in the budget justification. Um, another question, you may have already answered this, um, if an agency has been funded in a particular county for round three or four, can that funded agency apply for round five in a different county? No, any organizations, any funded partners, um, so if you have an Elevate Youth California award that goes beyond November 2023, if, you're, if your uh, uh, contract states that you're going to continue on into December, you are ineligible to apply as a lead applicant. Again, the only criteria around this is if you're a fiscal sponsor. There was a question in the chat that also asked about fiscal sponsor. Again, this is if you are the um, uh, at more so the financial administrator of, of another uh, organization. And so a fiscal sponsor means that you are not implementing the program, that another organization is, however, they may not have, um, they may not meet the eligibility criteria. They might be a grassroots organization that hasn't yet secured their 501c3, or you might be a fiscal sponsor for, um, you know, a handful of other organizations, and that's just the, the structure that's set up. And so that's what we mean by fiscal sponsors. Again, fiscal sponsors do not implement the program. So it is very important to make sure that when you're completing the application, if you are not eligible, that you do have a, a fiscal sponsor that meets the eligibility criteria. And if you are a funded partner that is implementing the program, you are not able, you are not eligible to apply for another award unless you're ending your award in November of this year. The only exception is that if you are a fiscal sponsor for another um, organization that is fully implementing the program. Um, another question, what is the difference between standard and capacity building track? If we are interested in capacity building, um, should we apply for the standard? This is a great question. So we have two funding opportunities, um, the standard track right now, and then the capacity building track, which is going to be released in early 2024. Um, if you are a small grassroots organization um, and you're interested in applying for the capacity building track, you can hold off. You can wait and hold off on that application. I will say that the only piece here is that if you are not proposing any policy systems or environmental change, if your organization doesn't have that track record, um, you're going to be less competitive for this funding opportunity. It is very intentional about supporting policy systems, systems and environmental change, and we do want to ensure that the um, uh, organizations that are uh, that are applying do have a track record of it as well. And so, if that you're not in that bucket. You could apply um, to be able to see, you know, what what you're pitching to be able to see that sort of response that you get. We do do feedback calls as well. The good thing is, is that if you are denied for the standard track, you can still apply for the capacity building track, and you will be notified before that application um, due date for the capacity building track comes up. Um, I cannot tell you which way to go, and I wouldn't recommend one way or the other. Um, you know, on one hand, you can it does take um, quite a big lift to be able to apply. Um, if you are, if you know you're not going to be competitive for this application and you don't want to do that work, you don't have to apply. Um, however, it may give you an opportunity to be able to complete the application and also be able to request a feedback call for, with us. 
Um, again, if you're not competitive all and you know, you're just looking to get feedback, there's only so much feedback that we're going to be able to give and it will be still tied to this particular funding opportunity. Um, so I'll just mention that um, in terms of the standard versus capacity building um, applications. Um, another question around, uh, will the availability of other funding requested for the project be considered in the evaluation of the proposal? This is a great question, actually, and someone asked this in the chat and I responded. So first, there was a general question around, is a match required? No, a match is not required. This funding opportunity does not require matched funding at all. The reason why we have the other committed funding um, on the narrative or on the budget document is for us to be able to better understand how your program is being supported. So we've had organizations that are receiving, um, you know, multiple sources of funding. They're building upon an existing program, and you know, when you're pitching, you know, you're working with. 50 youth over the course of three years, you're going to be having um, a, a leadership development program, you're going to be doing the policy systems change, you mentioned some partners in your application. And if we were to see your budget request from the center that doesn't list, you know, the staff that were mentioned in your application or the staff that would would be uh, responsible for the program. If you don't mention, you know, uh, the, cons uh, the, the partners that you're going to be working with and subcontracts that you might issue to them, or you don't mention other costs related to your program. It's hard for us to tell, did you did you think about that or did you just leave it out? And so instead of having to make those assumptions, we have the other committed funding um, column on the budget document for that specific reason, to be able to know what the entire budget of the program you're uh, proposing. Again, once you're awarded, it would only be the amount that you're only reporting on the amount that is uh, that has been awarded from the center. So uh, this, again, just allows us to be able to better understand your budget and, be, and ensure that the budget that you're proposing, as well as your narrative section aligns in terms of the program that you're proposing. Well, the size of the, um, there's another question around this. Um, so it's not considered in the evaluation. It allows us to be able to just um, better understand um, uh, your overall budget. And follow up on this question, you're not going to receive a lower score. It's not going to, you're not going to be more competitive if you have other committed funding or less competitive if you don't. Um, will the size of the requested amount relative to an organization's overall budget be considered? This is a great question. Um, we do factor in to some extent um, organization budget, um, annual organization budget to the requested um, amount. However, this is really a question about um, capacity. And so one of the narrative questions does talk about how you plan to implement the program. And so it's important for you to be able to include that on there as well. Uh, we have funded small organizations, um, larger amounts, things of that sort. We do not have any sort of concern with tipping because this isn't foundational support. Um, this this is coming from uh, the state uh, state tax dollars, so it it doesn't involve organizational tipping that typical um, foundation dollars would. So we don't have any um, requirements around that on that end. If we currently provide out-of-home placement for foster youth, probation youth, um, in a short-term residential treatment program and have certification with DHCS, can we apply to provide these prevention, intervention, and education services for our current population and their families? Can we also partner with local juvenile court schools, provide the same services to the youth in those settings? This is a great question. Um, so the, the key piece around this is, is as long as the, the work that's being done is prevention, intervention, and education services, there isn't any concern. The key piece I want to just mention is, is that any organizations that are providing treatment, this is not a, a solely a treatment, uh, a treatment program. Um, so it is important that the activities that you're pitching in your um, that you're proposing in your application align with this funding opportunity. So you are able to talk about substance use disorder prevention, but then you also focus on social justice youth activism. So again, very critical that you're you're mentioning that. And then in terms of partnering with the local juvenile court schools, not a problem whatsoever. Um, you're able to provide those services in other areas. Um, uh, I will mention that we do look at these priority populations. Um, so uh, it is important to note that in your uh, application. Um, so the question around LAHSA contract, is your organization still qualified? I'm not sure. What what that definition is? If someone, if you want to either email us or elaborate, that would be helpful. Um, can the same organization submit multiple applications for different regions? 
if you're proposing the same, um, if your organization, I, I would encourage you to only submit one application per organization. I can't remember if we have that listed on the RFA, but if you're pitching just the same program in different regions, I, I will just say that it's not going to increase your chance of being awarded. Um, I, it, it isn't, it, you know, you can mention that in your application that, you know, there's an opportunity to be able to support this program in different regions, that sort of piece, and uh, elaborate on that. But again, uh, submitting multiple applications um, for the same program in different regions will not increase your uh, chances of, of being awarded. I'm going to actually pause here. I'm going to come back to the questions. There's a handful of questions that were asked earlier as well. I'm going to get to them. We're probably going to go beyond 12 o'clock. But I want to make sure that in this first part of the recording, we um, uh, are able to prioritize, prioritize a slide deck for those who may have to jump off at 12. So we're going to continue on with the next slide. How to be competitive. So, um, you know, there's been a handful of questions around this next slide, um, and we'll hopefully be able to, to really address this here. Um, again, it's really, um, you know, the most competitive applications are those who are really complete and they're responsive to the application that, and the RFA that we're asking. And it's a, it's a mix of credentials, capacity, potential cost, potential and cost. So again, making sure that your narrative, your work plan, your budget and budget justification all align. It's very important to ensure that there isn't pieces that are missing. You know, so if you're again proposing a youth conference in your application, but there's no cost for the um, uh, youth conference in your budget, it's going to be a question. Um, so just making sure that it's complete and responsive to the specific RFA that we're that we have posted. You know, again, ensure that you're explaining why your organization is the appropriate organization to implement the program. You know, your track record um, and, and your history of engaging with the communities that you're proposing is really important. And again, highlighting that youth-led programming. So if you have already implemented as an organization youth-led programming, you have opportunities for youth to serve as leaders and have leadership development opportunities, it is critical for you to include that in your application. Utilizing innovative, culturally responsive approaches um, to the prevention program you're, you're um, uh, proposing, as well as understanding the role that trauma plays. Um, so really thinking about what, what, what role does trauma play in the development of young people and how you can respond with a culturally responsive program. So just really key to mention that as well. And then being able to also in, ensure that you're um, using an equity framework um, you know, we totally understand that young people in different areas and who belong to different communities do not need the same sort of programming and resources. This varies based off of um, various factors, um, but, you know, it's really important that you're thinking about aligning your programmatic activities and your outcomes to be able to promote health and racial equity for the young people that you're specifically working with. Next slide. Ensuring that you're committed to social justice youth development and an asset-based approach to youth engagement. So again, you know, the last thing we want to do is, is have zero tolerance programs that, you know, um, uh, that are, uh, once young people are engaging in substances, you're kicking them out of the program. That is not what this is about. You know, it's not about just saying no to drugs. It's really about thinking about an asset-based approach to youth engagement. So again, through those leadership opportunities, through ensuring that youth are leading the policy system change, so we really want to make sure that you're committed to that. Being able to explain that you have um, comprehensive youth engagement and a plan to engage youth that is also responsive to the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of ongoing recovery as well. Um, again, utilizing uh, prevention and education that's tailored um, and utilizes a stigma reducing approach. You're thinking about intersectionality um, to the health equity through the policy systems and environmental change that you're proposing and that you have clear and demonstrated screening and referral pathways. We don't expect for organizations to be a one-stop shop for all of the various um, uh, resources, you know, but so thinking about referral pathways. Um, so when higher level of substance use or mental health care is needed, or if it's needed, you do have an opportunity to be able to refer those out. Again, this is not a treatment program. So while, you know, uh, there might be some pieces around harm reduction, prevention, education that's included, um, we do want you to ensure that you have a referral pathway for those treatment services. Next slide. Proposal writing tips. Um, so again, read and follow the application guidelines and instructions. If you haven't already, please, please, please read the RFA in its entirety. I know it's long, but make your way through there. 
a lot of the questions that are asked today, as well as, you know, the questions that you might have are probably going to be answered. We're happy to continue to answer those because sometimes it's a little bit easier. Um, but again, I, I cannot stress enough to be able to read the application in its entirety. What we covered on this webinar is only a, a snapshot of what's included in the RFA. It has some examples of, uh, of, of, of some of the policy change work, examples of the various ways that you can ensure that young people are leading your program. And so it has a number of resources as well as links to other, other websites as well. Um, so we do encourage you to read it. Ensure that your organization is eligible. Um, we do get a handful of applications where the organization is not eligible. If you're a county behavioral health agency, email us and we'll confirm if you're eligible or not. I would hate for you to start working on your application for you to realize that you're not eligible. Um, so make sure that you do that as well. Answer questions clearly and provide enough detail. So again, make sure that you're responding to the question that's being asked. Um, and so if you have any questions around that, there is also that selection and evaluation criteria that's on page 13 of the RFA. You can review that. So once you have your um, question written out, um, you can go ahead and go back to that. Is am I am I addressing all of the various components of this question? And again, explain your proposed project and what change will result from the funding as well. Um, this is important to be able to include in your narrative as well as your work plan. And don't make any assumptions. You know that our reviewers will not know. You can't assume that they know about your organization, the work that you're doing, or any of those sort of pieces that aren't included on your application. So our reviewers will not make assumptions. Um, we will take your application in terms of what is submitted. Next slide. Check for consistency in the project description. Again, I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, does the project narrative, the work plan, budget narrative, and, and uh, budget justification and budget line items all align? It's important to make sure that's there. Um, I can tell you one of the common mistakes that we see is, is that a budget and budget justification don't align. So you need a breakdown for each of the costs that you're proposing in the um, budget line items. And then I will say the number one piece I can, I can also recommend, <laughs> the second piece after reading the RFA is having someone who isn't involved in your pro program or project or even your organization read your application and tell you what they think they're applying for. Because as implementers of the program, you have an understanding of what you're proposing. And sometimes what we write out isn't what exactly we need someone else who doesn't have that knowledge to be able to understand it. So again, really encourage you if you can find a friend, a family member, anyone who isn't involved in your program to be able to um, uh, read your application and be able to ensure that they um, tell you what they're applying for to be able to make sure that someone who isn't aware of your program does understand that. And again, review the attachments checklist and make sure you have all of the required documents. Um, it is important to be able to um, have all of those. Uh, any incomplete applications will not be reviewed. Um, so if you submit your application and you don't have all of your attachments, um, all of the fields are required. So if you try to submit and you don't have one of the attachments, it shouldn't let you submit. Um, but uh, just make sure again that you do have all those attachments. The last thing you want to do is, is you, you know, it's the 28th at like 12 p.m. and all of a sudden you forgot that you didn't complete the budget justification or you forgot that letter of support. And so um, just wanted to mention that as well as make sure you go through the attachment list. And there was a question and I think we'll get to it, um, but the end of the RFA has all of the questions on the application. So you can copy from the PDF all of those questions and be able to type them out in a Word document. Next slide. Um, just submission tips always hit save my progress. So right when you start, I would actually say save my progress and resume later. You know, um, if you wanted to do, just go ahead and make sure you were that the link's going to work, that your email inbox isn't going to cause any errors with having it go to spam or not receive it. Um, it wouldn't be hurt. It, it would be fine to go ahead and fill out maybe the first few sections and then hit save, confirm that you're able to come back to it, that sort of thing. Um, but I will say that if you are getting up from your desk click save because we have had folks who have emailed us. I will tell you on our end, we've done reviews and we forgot to hit save and all of that work we just completed was gone. So again, if your computer shuts off, there's something else happens, you know, there you're, you're, it doesn't auto save. So it is important for you to go ahead and click save. So my go-to is, is, you know, as soon as you're getting up from your, um, from your computer, if you're going to take a call or something else, go ahead and click save, and then you'll be able to resume uh, your application. Submit before the deadline. 
Um, so I know I mentioned the 12 p.m. on the 28th for some folks that might be earlier than the deadline, um, but I would really encourage you, if not, you know, the Friday before, um, at least that morning, try to submit. Um, because we've had a number of snags in terms of submitting at the very end. Again, folks might have forgotten an attachment. There might have been something else that was missing on there or the application is giving them an error. And what I'll say is, is that if you have any issues with applying, do not hesitate to email us. Um, email the elevateuca um, at shfcenter.org email that's listed in the RFA um, as soon as you receive an error message. Um, you know, if, if you receive it at the time of even the deadline, send us an email because we'll be able to work with you. We'll be able to get on a call with you, be able to resolve it. Um, what has, you know, what I would just make sure you do it as soon as you get that error message. Um, again, as mentioned, you can copy and paste your or copy from the RFA and be able to have your uh, responses of um, outside of the grant portal. Um, I always think it's the best way to be able to have those responses on a Word document. You'll be able to track your word count. You'll be able to make sure there's no typos or grammatical issues, that sort of thing. And you'll be able to have someone contribute to that as well um, without having to go into the portal. So again, um, I would highly encourage um, writing out and drafting those narrative questions outside of the application. Next slide. Continuing on, so again, review the application uh, uh, sort of instructions and criteria. Coalitions may apply, um, you know, as long as one, um, uh, as long as the leading uh, uh, organization is eligible, and that organization would be the applicant. Um, again, complete the application, the online portal, the application questions, the budget, budget justification, work plan, and W9, as well as the support letter from your administrator and executive. We don't have a draft template for the support letter, um, but again, the RFA has some additional pieces on there as well as the application on what to include. Next slide. Timeline, so the deadline to apply is August 28th at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, again, I do encourage you to go ahead and apply before that and submit your application just to make sure you don't run into any issues. Um, we do anticipate having the award announcement in late October with funds available in late November, again, contingent upon um, the execution of your uh, contract, um, as well as securing those insurance requirements, since this is a responsive based program. Next slide. I think we have our upcoming office hours. If there's any outstanding questions that you have from now till the um, end of the uh, award period or the application period, you're more than welcome to email us. Our team is pretty responsive, uh, pretty quick to respond to those messages. Um, so feel free to email us. Additionally, we'll have two opportunities for office hours. So um, we'll have two sessions on August 10th and August 22nd. Um, at the times listed, these are also, you're able to register with the links in the RFA. Um, this is an opportunity to bring your questions to that space. It'll be a meeting, not a webinar. So you'll be able to unmute yourself, ask your specific questions. It isn't done in a group setting. Um, so uh, you would be answering your, you're asking your questions in front of those who are on that call. Um, and that allows for those who may not have had those questions or thought about it um, to be able to hear the response to it too. And we'll pause on the next slide, which just has our contact information and some resources. And I'm going to go back um, to the list of questions to make sure we get through those and they're on the recording. But for those who have to jump off because it's 12 o'clock, um, we wish you the best in your application. We are super grateful for you to attend this webinar and stay through the end or watch it through the end. Um, again, I'll continue to answer those questions, but we wish you the best and um, we're, we're happy to help however we possibly can. So feel free to send us an email or attend our upcoming office hours. Okay, we're gonna go to questions, back to questions. Um, there was a question about counties that are eligible. Um, we're we're gonna go. We, we'll go ahead and share that on the FAQ document. If you are a county behavioral health agency, and again, this for counties, it's only the county behavioral health ag agency that this applies to. Um, so we do list in the RFA that it's the sole provider of the treatment or the sole provider in the county. Um, I apologize, my email was pre I'm having some issues, so I couldn't pull the list, but we will share that in the FAQ document. If you are a county behavioral health agency, send us an email and we'll confirm that you're eligible. Um, so you don't have to wait around for the FAQ document. That's gonna be posted later this week or early next week. Will, would a multi-issue policies change approach be valued, i.e. education and housing or a single issue preferred? This is a great question. Um, we do not have any preference on multi-issue 
or single issue um, focus. Um, we have seen a mix of, of proposals that have come through and a mix of um, applicants that have been awarded. Um, again, it is just ensuring that whatever you're proposing, the policy goal that you're proposing does tie back to the communities that you're working with. So um, great question, um, but no preference from our end. And you know, in general, I'll, I'll go ahead and reiterate, and I said this earlier, we, we really believe that community organizations and those who are proposing programs are best connected to the communities that they're serving. And so when we say that, we trust you in the program design um, and, and policy that you're pitching. And so, um, you know, again, I, I know it's hard because I've been on the other end of, of being a part of a CBO that's applying for grants as well and in a prior role. Um, so again, there's always this sort of ask of, well, what are you looking for? Um, and what I'll say is, is as a program, Elevate Youth California, and as an organization, the Center at Sierra Health Foundation, as well as the Department of Healthcare Services, we really value those who are doing this work and the experience that you have. So, you know, I will say it is, it is pretty easy, well, sometimes it is pretty easy to see the applicants who are pitching programs that they they believe we as reviewers or as a funder may want to pay, want to be able to fund. What I will say is, is that we can also tell those organizations who are pitching programs that are so needed. And so um, they reflect that the communities are serving, they're mindful of the demographic and the cultural responsiveness of the youth and young adults they're working with. And those shine out in terms of uh, our reviewer process. And so again, we, and I don't, I don't think I mentioned this on this call, we don't look for the most polished application. So if your application has a typo or two, I'm less concerned about that versus, again, is your track record, your history, your way in which you're engaging youth as leaders? Are you acknowledging also the shortcomings, right? If policy systems change or youth-led policy systems change hasn't been a key component of your organization, are you addressing on, uh, addressing that as well as including ways in which you're going to look to ensure that youth are leading this program. We know that organizations are are not, you know, may not be well versed in substance use disorder prevention and education, social justice youth development, so that policy systems and environmental change that's youth led, you know, and then the youth leadership component. And so we know that oftentimes organizations might be more strong suited in two of the three areas. And so one of the key pieces that I just want to say is, is that stay true to, to, to your mission, your, your vision of your organization, um, as well as uh, the proposed program that you're having. Um, and, and that can be done in, in, in a variety of ways. Let's say you're a youth-based organization that hasn't done substance use disorder prevention uh, previously. Well, prevention for us is that broadest way. So if you're working with young people, providing them opportunities, reducing risk factors, increasing protective factors, um, the, the variety of protective factors that exist, are you, you know, providing for, you know, greater resources around um, educational aspirations, you know, educational resources, are you, are you working around safe spaces for young people, you know, working around um, all of the various needs that young people have, um, that is prevention. And so, you know, it is, is very important to be able to sort of um, understand that and also um, focus on addressing those pieces as well. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention that because it's really important um, for us as a, as a, as a funder, um, and, but also um, as you're designing your program as well. Um, what is the policy goal? Um, the policy goal is asked on the uh, work plan. This is the specific policy systems or environmental change goal that you are going to be implementing as an organization um, that will be led as well. So we don't have that specific policy goal, but you will be developing that and pitching, uh, proposing that in your uh, work plan. Other policy ideas that are suited, that are considered unsuitable for the funding opportunity, increasing drug prevention centers in the community, syringe access and other harm reduction strategies, thanks. This is a really great question. Um, you know, all of these that are mentioned here definitely um, seem as if they relate. Again, it would be really ensuring that the youth and young adults that you're working with, that the policy goal is suited for them. Um, so let's say you're working with young people that, you know, don't have don't have any idea about syringe access. You know, thinking about, you know, let's say you're working with youth 12 to 16 year olds and and syringe access isn't even on their mind, you know, they're not really sure what that relates to. Thinking critically about the age group of the young people that you're working with and, and the policy sort of piece on that. 
Now, if you're working with young people who this is their re lived reality, you know, there might be members of their family, members of their friends, their social network that, that, you know, syringe access is a key component and they've seen that, then of course it's relatable. You know, so again, really thinking about the young people and centering them through the policy, because I can tell you a handful of times, oh, and we've worked with funded partners, um, they come back and they're like, I thought this goal was really going to resonate with the young people, and it just isn't. Um, and so there is an opportunity to change your goal after you've been awarded as well. But again, in your application, it's important to be able to address that policy goal um, that is uh, relatable to your program and, and the populations that you're working with. Um, the eligibility in criteria indicates that your organization must have an office located in California. Is this is a requirement emphasizing for a physical office or do we remain eligible if we are a virtual organization in Los Angeles? This is a really great question. Um, I would invite you to go ahead and send us an email to be able to clarify this. Um, we have had organizations who have headquarters outside of California. Um, but again, uh, services would need to per be provided in California, and so we do expect for staff. So you might not have a physical space in, in um, California, but again, you are you have a track record of working directly with young people in California. And so given the sort of um, recovery around COVID-19, um, we are looking for programming to also take place in person, so not just to be virtual. But um, I do invite this um, participant to go ahead and uh, send us an email, and we can further elaborate if needed. There's a few more questions. Um, should the budget request be for year one or for the entire duration of the grant? The budget should be for the entire duration of the grant. The template includes on uh, three separate columns uh, where the total will auto populate. So again, um, you can apply for up to a million dollars over three years. So it's not a million dollars for each year. It's a total of a million dollars that's going to be um, utilized over the three year period. Um, if we have a grant funded by Prop 64, not, call, not called Elevate Youth, are we eligible? Yeah, if you have a funded program that's not, if you're not funded through Elevate Youth California, you're eligible to apply as long as you meet all of the other eligibility criteria. Can you apply if you have been contracted out by another Elevate Youth guarantee to do a specific population work under their grant, but now you want to get your own grant to do other projects? Yes. If you do not have, if you are not the um, applicant of an Elevate Youth California grant and you're subcontracted out or um, consulting on uh, another program, you are eligible to apply. We've had some um, successful uh, applicants who have showed up in that way. But again, if you have an active award for Elevate Youth California and it is continuing past November, you're not eligible to apply. If you're awarded um, this grant, will it impact the ability to apply for the upcoming capacity building grant? Yes, it will. So if you are awarded, if you apply for the standard track, you will not you will not be eligible to apply for another uh, award um, for Elevate Youth California until your uh, current award is going to be ending. Um, now we have we have strategically placed a standard track before the capacity building track because this award is larger. It does focus on policy systems change, whereas the capacity building um, uh, award uh, or the capacity building track focuses on building the organizational infrastructure of an organization. Um, so again, you can apply for this. It doesn't um, affect you applying for the, the capacity building award or RFA that's going to be out early next year. But if you are awarded, um, you wouldn't be eligible to apply for that. Um, at, we answered the question around county behavioral health applicants. So again, that's for the um, department makeup not, um, in terms of the question that is being asked on the application. Can we work with multiple rural communities within two counties, um, Fresno County and Madera County? Yes, you're able to work within multiple counties in general. So not just rural counties, but just in general, you're able to pitch them on, as Shira showed you on the application and ask the percentage in each county. Can we work, oh, oh, that's the same question. If a non-funded partner on a capacity building grant and is a volunteer non-paying partner, does that prohibit the non-funded partner from applying? So if you're a non-funded partner, again, if you're consulting out on a ward or you're a volunteer or related to any other funded or Elevate You California um, uh, award that's beyond November, um, you're still eligible to apply. Again, it's if you are the implementing organization for a current award, you're not you're ineligible to apply. So if you aren't the funded partner, um, but you're supporting on it, you you would be eligible. If you have greater question around this, again, email us, we'll confirm. 
Um, is there an ideal number? Oh, this is another great question. Is there an ideal number of or range of individuals served over the three year grant period that applicants should keep in mind? This is a great question. There is not an ideal number. We do have a wide range of a number of individuals served by an organization. And this is because an organization who is working with 10 people on a um, multiple times a week is going to be very different than an organization who is working with 50, 100, 200. Um, I think some of our partners go up to 1,500 youth that they work with. Um, you know, of course, it's not just uh, through this funding, but potentially other funding as well. But um, again, uh, it will really depends on your sort of engagement and the program you're pitching. So we don't have an ideal range. We've seen, we've funded a wide range of partners from a dozen to dozen all the way up to a few hundred. Um, again, the key piece is that in your work plan, you'd want to include the, the activities that are going to be in the program you're pitching. Um, is there a different funding opportunity for grassroots organizational projects? Yes. So the capacity building um, uh, opportunity is going to be available in January, um, or it's estimated to be available in January 2024. Um, uh, and so one of the key pieces, again, to this is that you can apply for this one. And if you are not awarded, you know, you can still apply for that one. But again, if you're a small grassroots organization and you don't have the track record and history of the prevention work, of uh, youth-led work, of policy systems change, and you know you're not going to be competitive and you want to hold off, that's totally fine. We leave it up to you. Um, but again, you are eligible, to, or if you meet the eligibility criteria, you're able to apply. There's another question that says, can you please explain in detail the services required to provide under the program? We do not have specific services that are required. Um, there are key components around the deliverables, um, around the minimum one youth listening session, attending two two-day in-person convenings, um, which are all noted in the RFA. In regards to the services or program activities that you're going to be pitching, um, that really depends on uh, your organization and, and what you want to um, uh, propose. So again, um, we, we don't have... in. I, the entire webinar <laughs> in some ways. Uh, but again, the, the specific requirements are listed in the RFA. Um, and then other than that, it's just the programmatic activities that your organization is proposing through your narrative and work plan. Um, I think this might be the last question for now, but can we use the funding to provide transportation access, um, i.e. Uber to the program activities? This is a great question. So we do have a limitation and, um, you know, I will mention that um, there is a limitation around $50 per participant per year for transportation incentives. Um, uh, so Uber, Lyft, um, you know, taxi cab, all of that, it'd be $50 per, youth, uh, per year. However, if your organization provides transportation services, does mileage, there isn't a limitation around that. Um, or if you have youth, young adults who um, do drive or their parents and you want to go ahead and provide them with mileage, with mileage, there isn't any um, constraint on it as of now. But if you are providing um, incentives or not compensating them for the exact amounts of sort of travel by mileage reimbursement, um, uh, it would be limited at the $50 per participant per year. And another question came up, what about food? We do not have any restrictions around food in the program. Um, and on our sort of uh, max cost, our sort of uh, allowable cost, um, many of our programs have food um, at, um, in a part of their programming. Um, and so that's not um, any sort of, uh, there's no limitations around it. Um, again, uh, if you're providing food at an event, um, there aren't any limitations around it. Um, you know, but again, if you're providing food for a, a young person um, that's outside of your that's outside of the programmatic activities, that's something that we would probably want to just confirm. Um, but we have, you know, given that there's uh, funded partners who work with youth um, who might be facing housing insecurity, um, have financial constraints. There's been some ways to be able to include incentives and stipends for young people. So we would just want to mention that. But so I add that caveat given that, um, uh, you know, uh, beyond the sort of uh, food app programming. Okay, well, I think that is all of the questions. Um, it's all of the questions that I see in the chat that my team has flagged for me. 
Um, just want to give a huge shout out to all of the, uh, all of my uh, team members uh, for keeping track of all the questions and making sure we got through all of them for responding in the chat. Um, and uh, again, thank you all for sticking on. I know we're 18 minutes over. Um, oh, there's a, can you repeat the transportation question? You mentioned incentives. Does that include limit on stipends? So the transportation piece is around transportation incentive. So um, if you are providing, um, so if you are either, if uh, young people are coming to your program and you are, you know, be it Uber, Lyft, taxi cab, um, or, or you want to provide them with gas incentive, um, you would only be able to provide $50 per participant per year. And again, if uh, I would say, you know, don't don't worry too much about this because once you're awarded, we'll look at your budget, your budget justification, and, and keep that in mind. We'll give you a sort of tip sheet at the start of the program, that sort of thing. But um, if you do do mileage reimbursement, there isn't a cap on mileage reimbursement. And again, because this is funded through the state, um, uh, you do have to follow the Cal HR uh, travel requirements. And so that's um, we you aren't able to pay for gas for staff or participants, um, uh, travel is only compensated through mileage reimbursement through this program. Um, again, we'll, we'll list that on the FAQ as well as um, uh, I'll be able to share that. And, but <clears throat> again, if you are doing mileage, no, no restrictions on it, no restrictions on um, staff stip or participant stipends either. So if you are doing um, stipends for your program, there aren't um, uh, any um, uh, uh, restrictions around that. Again, we will want you to be mindful, so it's important for you to list in your budget justification, um, you know, that amount per per young person um, and how uh, frequently that would be given that sort of piece. So, you know, um, it's important to be able to be keep in mind, you know, how many activities, what sort of engagement is done with young people and um, what what they're being compensated. Um, another question is landscaping of an outdoor youth facility allowed. Um, again, you can propose this in your budget. It would really depend. And I would just ask you to clarify what does that look like? Um, uh, you know, th uh, this might be something that is uh, probably included in, a, in, a, in an indirect cost, I would say, um, given that uh, if your outdoor youth facility is used across multiple programs, there might be a smaller percentage of the cost of the landscaping versus all of it being um, charged to uh, the EYC program. So, um, you know, I would really encourage you to also um, uh, ask some of these uh, particular questions around costs that are spread across programs. Um, your financial person, your financial um, team member might be able to um, better uh, answer some of these questions around what is better suited for an indirect cost. Um, and uh, if you are including these in your direct costs, it's important for you to go ahead and put in the justification um, how, uh, you know, if this is a shared cost uh, across other programs and um, that sort of piece. Another question, can we lease purchase a vehicle? Um, no, purchasing of a vehicle is not allowed in the program. Um, this is also included in the RFA. Um, I will mention that there are a handful of non-allowable costs in the RFA um, and that is listed on page 10. Um, so uh, some of the common pieces around purchase of vehicles, purchase construction or permanent improvement of, of, of building spaces, purchase of properties, those are all non-allowable costs. And all, there's a few additional pieces that are um, uh, the non-allowable costs that are listed on page 10 of the RFA. Okay, well, that takes us through all of the questions. Again, thank you all for staying on. Um, we really appreciate um, you sticking uh, through all of the questions and, uh, oh, there's another question. Uh, can a Food 101 training for youth be acceptable as prevention to redirect their attention from drugs? Yeah, you know, a Food 101 training, nutrition uh, nutrition sort of uh, court classes, um, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, uh, a lot of training, a lot of, um, uh, resources, sort of uh, programmatic activities that, um, you know, are considered to be prevention. And again, thinking about uh, the young people that you're uh, working with. Um, so, you know, uh, nutrition, there's been some financial literacy court, uh, trainings, things of that sort. Um, so uh, a wide range of those uh, trainings or courses could be uh, definitely um, considered as prevention. Thanks for this question. 
Okay, so with that, we're going to go ahead and end um, today's webinar. Again, the recording will be placed, um, will be posted online along with the slide deck, um, and then we um, hope to have the FAQ document um, with all the questions from the webinar and those that have been asked over um, email as well posted to our website by early next week. Thank you all and have a great rest of your week and best wishes on your application.